Saving seeds from tomatoes is something you want to do early in the seed saving season because you want to try to make sure you select varieties that are going to fruit early because of our climate. And so part of that is involved in selecting for other traits also, um, flavor, size, uh, overall production. Uh, the first thing I always look at is health and vigor of the plant. Uh, tomato diseases can definitely be spread through seed and through genetics of predisposition. So you want to go for a healthy plant to begin with, but after that you start selecting for these other things. Um, once you might have one particular trait that you're really trying to nail down and you might just select for that for one year, but the next year make sure you start looking at the other things. Uh, when it comes to saving tomato seed, yes, you can save seed from hybrids. And yes, they will make plants for the most part. There's a few exceptions, but not many. But um, I definitely would leave that to the experienced safe seeder that's been doing it for 30 years because you have to select and breed down to establish a stable variety. And that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of what somebody else has already done. <laughs> that's, that's my feeling. A lot of, you'll hear a lot of hype with tomatoes about heirlooms and saving seed from an heirloom that's a really, really old variety. But um, if you have a variety that's been grown for a hundred years, hopefully whoever's been saving seed of it has been selecting for improvement because I want that tomato that was acceptable a hundred years ago, you know? So always think in terms of even if it's an heirloom, that's not a magic word. Uh, there's people that are coming up with new varieties now that outshine some of the heirlooms. But if you find a tomato you love the flavor of, save the seed. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing that you want to make sure that you do without exception is to let the tomato get fully, fully ripe. Ripe to the point where you almost don't want to eat it. Uh, this one still could go another day or two days, though you can see with this darker coloring in here that it's beginning to be very ripe. This is a Cherokee, Cherokee purple. This one comes from Prairie Roads seeds in uh, North Dakota, where she's been growing them for some years, uh, trying to get a u more uniform tomato for market, uh, keeping the flavor and the other characteristics, but not having as irregular a shape. You know, a lot of the heirlooms have real irregular shapes that make them hard to use. Sometimes it's frustrating, you feel like you're throwing out more tomato than you're eating. So this one could be slightly riper. So I'm gonna start by showing you how to gather the seeds from this and then we'll talk about the next stage. If you have cherry tomatoes, it's really, really simple. You throw them in the blender. <laughs> So get a cupful or two cupfuls of cherry tomatoes from a vine that you really like or that you really enjoy from someone else and throw them in the blender and blend them. And you've missed this whole first stage. But if you're going with a larger tomato, start by cutting it horizontally approximately in half. And you see immediately, we've lost some of the seed here. Oh, we'll take that off and we're done. Maybe there'll be more to join it. So what I want to do, and on this tomato, it's relatively easy. That's why I brought this one. Some of the paste varieties and some of the larger beef steak varieties, you won't have such a large cell here with this gel in it. And you might only have, you might only see four or five seeds in the whole thing. So it depends on the type of tomato. Some of them you cut open and there's a lot of large cells mm -hmm. and there'd be a lot more seeds in conjunction with it. But what we want to do is take the seeds out and I find the silverware knife the easiest way to do it like this. Some people just squeeze the whole thing 
Um, I prefer not to have a lot of excess pulp in with them. And I like to be able to use the tomato after mm -hmm. I've taken the seeds out. So you can see how they just come out as you twist. If you have a very large, very full uh, beefsteak type that has very few seeds and very few cells like this, you may need to add a little bit of additional water to the seeds in order to have enough liquid to ferment them. We want to ferment them because the process of fermentation is going to destroy some of the disease organisms that can be carried on the tomato seeds. And I've, I've gotten seeds from reputable seed companies and planted out that variety with the other 10 varieties that I've planted out and had everything in that variety die from disease that you know it came on the seed. I mean, it's just the way it was. It doesn't hurt to give it a little extra squeeze to see if there's something you left behind and to get a little more of that juice out of there. Now, normally when I do these, I do half a dozen at a time. And I would take them, for instance, if I were going to do a half dozen, I would take them from three plants, two tomatoes off of each plant, or even from six plants, all the same variety, of course. You know, we're not going to mix up varieties, but all the same variety. Um, it's good to keep that genetic diversity in there. And so even though there might be a message, a gene in there with a message on it that you can't read because there's no signal showing itself, um, one of those plants might be more resistant to disease or um, it might bear longer in the fall and you won't know that yet. So it's good to keep the genetic diversity going with using seeds from more than one plant. And it's also a little bit easier to get the fermentation thing going if you have a little larger quantity of seed. Um, of course, you don't need the number of seeds you'd get from that. Uh, easily, you, sh you should get about 50 seeds from a tomato. But again, it depends on the variety. But um, I've never had anybody turn down seed. <laughs> you had way too much and said, you know, this is going to get old. It needs to be used. You want some. Most of the time you can find a taker. So again, we'll just give it a little squeeze. Sometimes you'll squeeze like that and you'll see a bunch of little seeds pop out. You know, like that. <laughs> So along, just like other varieties, other kinds of fermentation, um, this ideally would sit at 70 degrees. Now that's actually got a pretty good amount of liquid in with it too. So if it were less liquid than that, I would add a little water. And if you add a little water, you might have to add a pinch of sugar also to make up for the dilution of the sugars. So I would sit this Usually my kitchen counter gets everything set on it, so that's where it would probably go. But um, it needs to just be set in a warm place where you're not going to forget about it. No lid. No, I don't. I don't put a lid on them. Uh, if you've got fruit flies, it's that time of year, and there's fruit flies, I'd put maybe a paper towel over it or something to discourage them from entering it. But if there's nothing like that going on, then you don't need a lid on it. And three days later, you should have this. Now, when I started out this morning, this white was a solid covering all the way across the top. But in just moving it to get here, I ended up shaking it a little bit, even though I didn't try to. So you can see how now there's, um, it's broken up, but you can see how it still wants to float and it's a solid covering. 
<laughs> okay, so if we look at this, if you look closely, you can already see the seeds on the bottom. Is that lighting adequate for you? Can you see? <laughs> look at me shake. So there's already some seeds that have drifted to the bottom. So what I would do, yeah, I took everything out of there. And I would usually do this over my kitchen sink. I'm gonna add some water and you'll see how the seeds move around and rotate and how as it settles, a lot of them have moved to the bottom. And the moldy stuff, and I should have let you smell uh, it. I smelled it. You smelled it. <laughs> it smells like kind of like wine mm -hmm. or something, I don't know. But uh, the moldy stuff and the seeds that are not any good, the seeds that didn't get whatever they needed to continue going, are going to be on the top. So I just very carefully pour off all this material that's floating up here. And you don't have to get way down close at that point, but you can see how we've... Mm -hmm. And then add more water. And again, let them sit just a minute. You can see how the good seed will just settle right down the bottom. And when you've been doing this a while, you begin to realize that if you lose some seeds, it's not a big deal because you'll have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in the long run. So. gets better all the time, huh? Mm -hmm. And there will be some particles that will settle down the bottom of them. If you just swish them a little bit, they usually pop back up. If you have just one tomato or a very special variety, you're gonna be pickier, you know. I'm gonna start pouring before everything settles too much in order to get rid of some of that debris. And basically that's it. Next step would be, and I'll go ahead and add some more water just so it's easier to pour. Pouring all of it into a strainer. And then I would let's see. Mm -hmm. And they're already relatively clean. I would continue to rinse these under running water for a few more minutes just to make sure I got as much of the debris off of there as I could. Then I would sit them on a, either a fabric towel or some layered paper towels or something like this. Let that just sit there for a little bit so that some of the water will drain out and soak out. So you have the three days where you're letting them just sit and not doing anything to them, but this process should all happen really quickly, mm -hmm. this cleaning. You don't want to add water to them and then walk away and let mm -hmm. it sit because you've diluted that fermentation and things are gonna get wacky or change in there. So, so then I would just take them and um, I'm going to use a paper plate right now, but I don't like to use paper plates or napkins or any paper products because generally what happens is the seed sticks. Mm -hmm. So I just use a regular dinner plate mm -hmm. and just put them out on there and they'll start to dry and I put them in an obvious place, um, usually my dining room table, because what I want to do is several times a day as I walk by, I'll 
move them around again and spread them out again. Now these are not quite as clean as they should be because I can feel the sticky mm. residue still on them. But if you just let them sit like that and then every few hours when you walk by them, stir them around again or break them up a little bit until they're thoroughly dry. The thoroughly dry part can be tricky depending on humidity in the air. Do you leave them like near open window or? Um, air on them is very beneficial and so if you've got a place where there's air movement like under a fan, under a ceiling fan, or um, I, you, there have been times when we've been, uh, when we're doing seed with the seed companies and we've got a large batch of them and we'll actually blow a fan directly oh. on them to, okay. to dry them out and help them dry in time. Um, what if you hung them in a tea bag? I want to say that it would hold moisture in rather than helping mm -hmm. it evaporate faster. I think that it needs to be out uh, where air can circulate around each seed. So, because I will spread them out more and more like this till by the end of the day they're, they're all mm. spread out. So they're all kind of individual to be able to dry well. And um, normally I'd say about three days, but again, that depends on the humidity. Okay. Um, it could be less than three days for total drying if you've got you know, really dry air coming in. But if we've got a really humid day, you might take four or five days. Hmm. Um, better to have them too dry than not dry enough. And then after they're totally dried, and oh, the other thing that I do is usually, and of course this isn't usually, um, I have a little piece of paper that I've taped to the first container, like a post-it note kind of thing. And I'll tape it to the first container with the date and the variety and where it came from. And then I'll keep moving it with that mm. so that it's on the plate then. Mm. And then when I put it in a final container, whether it's an envelope or a jar, I transfer that information to it. Um, and in spite of that fact, I've had times when I planted one seed and ended up with another because mm -hmm. of somehow, mm -hmm. you know, one the paper blew off of one and somebody picked it up and put it on the wrong one or whatever, you know. So you do want to be really careful about keeping track. It's kind of embarrassing to give somebody beef steak seed and have it be cherry tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's about all that's involved and that seed should be really good. Um, you can test it for germination simply by taking a napkin and, and putting 10 seeds on it and fold it over and dampen it and slip it inside a plastic bag and keep it like on a countertop or something and check it every day to see and if 10 out of 10 seeds germinate then you know you've got 100% germination. Mm -hmm. You would hope that you would have germination within three, four days you'd see the little white root mm -hmm. coming out. Um, but if you've been 10 days without germination, something's gone very mm -hmm. wrong and so you just don't even okay. keep trying. So, and store them cool and dry, cool and dry, cool and dry. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of folks that store them in freezers now. I'm just old enough that I'm still somewhat hesitant to put them in the freezer because if there's still a degree of moisture in there, um, it will burst them oh. instead of, so um, before there were such sophisticated means of measuring the moisture in mm -hmm. seeds, um, you just always had a risk there. So that's why I always just uh, keep them in a cool, dark place under a bed is usually really good. Mm -hmm. or, you know, some place that's uh, under a dresser in a cool room or something like that. How long do they last? With any luck, for sure, five or six years. Oh. So that's why you can do a whole bunch at one time because um, you know they'll last five or six years and you won't need to do it again mm -hmm. until then. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do that every year. Most garden seed will last five or six years, uh, not parsnips. Sweet corn doesn't like to be aged. Onions don't like to be aged. Um, but almost everything else will last for sure three to four and with any luck five to six. And I've had stuff that was longer than that. Um, 
I've got a tomato that was not grown out for 20 years and then was grown out and it's back in circulation again, mm, so. Nice. Yeah. It's is cool. this process only for tomato seeds? This <laughs> process is called wet processing and you'd use it for tomatoes or watermelon or cantaloupe, anything that's kind of wet and pulpy that has pulp oh. on it that you want to get off. Oh, okay. So um, any of those kinds of okay. seeds, you would probably use that process okay. with. Okay. Uh, some people wouldn't use it anyway, but I still think you're better off fermenting it okay. to begin with. Okay. And we certainly did with watermelon and cantaloupe. Okay. So. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So, <clears throat> some seed? Oh, gosh. <laughs>